First of all, thank you for, for tolerating my, my one desire to sort of have a, a circle. Um, I, I don't, uh, uh, I want to get your ideas, and I don't know if there's a better way to do it than this. And, and my students react the same way when I, when I, when I try to create a circle. You know, like a lot of them would prefer the PowerPoint, but uh, I don't learn a lot from my students when I do it that way, and my goal this semester is to learn from my students, which is kind of what led me to this. Um, so I'm an associate professor of history at Marshall University. Um, many associate professors fall into this uh, academic malaise. I don't, I don't know if you're familiar with feminine mystique, this, you know, this idea of you, know, you, you reach what you thought you wanted and then you ask yourself, is this all? Um, and for me, OER is a way to keep my job fun. And I think that's part of the point. Um, so I've been creating OER for a long time, I just didn't know that that's what I was doing. Um, I was a grad student in 2005 at the University of Kansas, and I, they asked me to teach a class on Kansas history. Um, this was going to be all seniors, right, because no one wanted to take Kansas history, but they had to if they wanted to teach it. And so I had all seniors, and they just wanted out of there, but I had this idea for a project because I didn't want to write, I didn't want to read 60 papers off of the ball of twine or whatever, research papers they might write. I had recently read a book on the Exodusters. The Exodusters were African-American migrants that left the Deep South in 1879 looking for what was an exodus, you know, leaving the land of oppression for what they hoped would be the land of milk and honey. And the books were ended when the Exodusters show up in Kansas. And so I did some work with the State Historical Society and said, look, we have over 100 newspapers on my books from 1889 to so I assigned every student to check out one of those newspapers on my profile. And, they, you know, and, and I actually got the State Historical Society to bring all of their microphones physically to our campus, which is no small feat if you're working with an archive, okay? But because I was able to do that, the students were, they didn't have those excuses of, like, I can't get them. There was no excuse. So they did the work. And I had students come to me, and they were in tears because, and I thought, you know, oh, you, 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 you look through the newspaper, and you didn't find any sources. Oh no, no, and they, they, they proudly pulled out like a file of all these newspaper clippings. But this doesn't say what the book said. I said, that's just the point. We're creating this. So what we did was we created a book. We collectively published a book. They each wrote the summary of what they had found. And we, we collectively published. I use that term loosely. We didn't, you know, it wasn't an academic. And then we took all the sources that they found, and we sorted them, and we donated them back to the State Historical Society. So in one semester, we added the aggregate of human knowledge. And I had created this, this little kinko sort of book and, and gave it out to area libraries. Students wanted it. I said, no, you, you, it's a, it costs like $30. I, I, I don't have a budget. I'm sorry. They brought their own money because they were so proud of what they had done. So when I finally did uh, you know, get my real job, I was at Baltimore, Towson University. I thought you know, I was teaching class in African American history at Towson University of Baltimore. So let's do the same thing. Everyone pick a topic, and I vetted some topics, made sure that there were sources there, and I usually had one or two sources to get them started. You know, some sort of archival source to get them get them started. So they don't do the floundering thing that, that they might do. And we created a book on African American history in Baltimore. We did the same thing. We printed it. We gave it to every library. Well, then a little later, I got my uh, my job at, at Marshall University, and I thought, well, you know, those, those printed books, I don't think they've been really flying off the shelf in the library, so I'll create a website. So we created a website on African American history in Appalachia. Um, students found old, uh, WSAZ was our, our station, they found the old uh, footage of civil rights sit-ins in the 1960s in my town. And they found them, and of course they had to digitize these, and this was no small feat because the technology, they actually had to find something that would play that clip, and then they had to find the, because they, they, they did the uh, audio and the video were divorced from one another, they actually had to find the written uh, source, but they did. And so now I have a website on African American history in West Virginia that I didn't create, because I don't know how to do it. Uh, but one of the students wanted to be a web designer. So, you know, all right. And uh, so now, when I'm talking about the Civil Rights Movement in my class, I show a clip from that. And it's, uh, you see a, a few students uh, stumbling out of, and I couldn't make this up, but the place was called the White Pantry Restaurant. 
the downtown Huntington. You see a couple students sort of stumbling out there, and one of them sort of falls to the ground and she's coughing. Well, the owner had actually uh, chlorine bombed his own restaurant uh, to get these students. And I'm showing this to a classroom of 180 students, and they just you know, really seem impressed at all. Going on. Well, eventually the camera pans out, and you see the Huntington, West Virginia skyline. At that point, every single student comes to the edge of their seat. When all you see are dogs biting people, yeah, you know, a student had a hard time gasping for air. That's not very. But there was this happened in our town. Yeah, sure, it did. And so every semester I've done something like that. I, I recently did a Fifty Shades of Suffrage. Um, where every, <laughs> student was, every, every student looked at um, historic newspapers in the state of their choice between 1915 and 1917 and looking at women's suffrage. The stuff they found. Um, you know, all my colleagues are bored on, on a stormy Tuesday night because they got to read 90 papers on Genghis Khan and you know, 45 of them have been plagiarized. <laughs> you, can't, you can't plagiarize this. I mean, they, they'll try, but I, I asked them, I said, submit all these clippings to me, and I want to see them. And, and there's no way to fake that. And so I'm reading these, and you know, sometimes their interpretations are slightly off, but I, I learn a lot in the process. Um, you know, these bootleggers somehow get involved in women's suffrage in a few of the states near Appalachia. Um, it's incredible stories. Um, Lastly, I'm, I'm creating a, an open um, uh, web application uh, called Clio that sort of works like uh, Yelp, except for history. Picks up your location and tells you where the history is around you. And um, what's interesting to me is that I can use this as a tool to show what didn't happen or what did happen. Not just, you know, I'm, I'm promoting museums and historic sites and all that kind of, and, and that's important to me. But I have students that are finding uh, pictures of a lynching. And you can go to that spot in downtown, uh, in Omaha, and you can hold the picture up against the landscape and see hundreds and hundreds of people circling around the dead body. Uh, it's a powerful sort of thing. You can go to uh, Charleston, West Virginia, and you'll see a landscape of uh, interstates but you'll hold it up and you'll see the black community that used to be there. Right? That to me is, is, is one of the potentials of the world. Also, I created an open textbook with uh, flat world knowledge. I know many of you have a, a, a strong feeling about, about them. Um, I do as well. Um, I, I, I was hurt when, when, when it went away from open. I wasn't sure why, because when I thought about it logically, I thought, well, you know, if it would ask me to do a $19 textbook, I would, I would have thought that was wonderful. But then I, I had this other idea of what it would be. Well, one of the things that we were able to do, because you can still edit those books, is one of my students is really interested in Appalachian history. He wants to teach Appalachian history. He's a grad student. Uh, he's teaching classes now. So he adapted my book by sprinkling in little bits of Appalachian history in it. And the students just love it. I, I've lectured about labor strikes in Chicago to at least, at least 2,000 students. And not one has asked me a question about it. But when we get to the section on the Battle of Blair Mountain where the United States Army Air Corps bombs coal miners in West Virginia, I can't know enough. Right? And that to me is one of the, some of the real potentials of open. You know, I'm not interested in creating the 17th United States History Textbook. Right? You can get these books for, you know, you, I, I use one book from Pearson. I use the third edition, they're on the sixth edition, it costs my students $10. All right, when the bookstore refuses to get it for me, I went on the, the various websites. I bought the book myself. It cost me $300, and now the books are you know, $10 for the students still if they need the new bookstore. It's, there's plenty of stuff out there. Right? To me, lowering cost is, 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 is maybe the least interesting thing about open. Uh, it's the creativity to, to create something new every semester and then adapt it and get better. And my hope is, is that a textbook, what I created, could become a living document people could have conversations about why do you include this and not this? You know, why is it that there's one, uh, one sit in every U.S. history textbook? Right? There's, there's, there's one freedom ride. One of my friends was one of the freedom riders. Uh, this narrative, this dominant narrative, where we only include one of the 80 and we don't mention that there were 79 others, is so powerful that to my own friend I asked, what were you thinking when they, when they firebombed the bus? 
even though I knew she wasn't on that freedom ride, and I know that history, it's still, you know, I, I go to a history conference in Chicago, and people talk about, oh, there's so much labor history here. Okay, where are you from? Colorado? You know? So my idea is that we could challenge the narrative in all of our disciplines. Okay, what, what are your ideas of, of how open could be useful in, in, in history or, or any other discipline? Um, like I said, I care about the cost, but we're not going to change the world by saving a few hundred dollars for student. First of all, I use your textbook on Plot World, so thank you. Thank you. <laughs> thank you. Uh, thank you. Uh, this is an <coughs> honor for me to meet you. Okay. Um, well, I, I love I, 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 I'm, I'm just honored to meet somebody who uh, <laughs> gave it a chance. <laughs> <laughs> Everyone should check it out. Um, but uh, I teach at Mount Heights Academy. I teach social studies courses okay. as well. And so we do, uh, we try to implement at a, I mean, a high school level. They're not producing like these fabulous research assignments, but they are making really good videos and things like, they do a project where it's called History in the Hood, and they go, they have to find something within, <laughs> yes, within their neighborhood, so within like 30 minutes. Um, just here in Utah, they have to find something, and there's tons of stuff. And so I, like you, I kind of try to start them with a, a report, with like some sort of, place to go so they're not totally confused. Um, but they can look up like, oh, events that happened, but then I encourage them to go on location and actually film themselves. Like, here I am standing at this cemetery, and this is where this happened, mm -hmm. and things like that. And so we have them create this, and what I'm wondering what you do, and also kind of my question is what to do then with these yeah. things that they're making. Like, right now, they just turn it in, and I say, good job, and right. we have a fun little chat about it. But Right, I mean, find a way to preserve it, because I started preserving this stuff because they did better work. Mm -hmm. They were terrified that they would be in trouble if they plagiarized. Because I told them, I said, it'll be 10 years from now, and you'll, you'll have a new job, and your life will be going well, and someone's going to tell you <laughs> that someone's going to catch you, and I'm going to take your degree away. I, I don't know. That. <laughs> they, they, they did better work, right? So, I mean, and, and preserve it because they, they, they love it. Mm -hmm. they, they put it on their resumes. They, you know, they. They, they bug you five years later, which is the email you love to get. Um, so, a website, perhaps? Is that what you've mostly done? Then That's the latest thing. Your research and, and I don't know anything about how to do a website, but my goodness, it's, it's not hard anymore, right? Yeah. You know, it's, and, and there's probably young people that totally could help. <laughs> <laughs> Or criticisms. I mean, I, I really the history conference. We love we love criticism of each other, and it makes us better. And, and if someone's giving you a hard time, it means they, they, they care about what you're doing. Well, I'm, I'm, go ahead. Okay. <laughs> yeah. um, well, I'm I'm from Kentucky, and I'm wondering. You know, some of us have similar narratives. You know, okay. being on that Appalachian corridor, we've got a statewide repository for Kentucky materials. Um, you know, across the some borders. We built this timeline of stuff about uh, the industrial age, this, that, and the other. We made these little units. There's printable stuff, um, connections to other repositories. Uh, you know, I'm curious about you know where do you put it? Mm -hmm. Now, for now, it's a website. But what if we could connect these easily, mm -hmm. where it's my Kentucky stuff by my Kentucky historians? Mm -hmm. K-12, you know, history teachers plus post-secondary faculty student work mm -hmm. connected to yours, yeah. connected to yours, where it's this, I mean, I just yeah. hate, I hate, I hate yeah. just throwing it out to the web. But, but I can't imagine also yeah. exporting it into some object right. and then throwing it to a repository where it's, it's just as undiscoverable. Right. Because there is so like, much stuff out there. What about like a local history, like a local history website and a map, and you would have pinpoints on the map for everyone doing projects, yeah. and then you would link out, you know, your website, yeah. you would link out, you know, there'd be like a sort of hub website for it. I mean, there's a, there's a, the HNET, I mean, I'm sorry to go off on a history tangent, sure. but there's HNET, there's H Kentucky, there's H Asia, you know, there's these listservs that are specific to timelines and mm -hmm. periods and places, but still, that's an enclosed community. Yeah. yeah, and they're not like OER, yeah. so the question is like, do we go to like OER Commons, and should we like link to the website? Probably, I mean, there's probably something we should do to make 
like if I wanted to see your Appalachian material, like mm -hmm. that I could find that more easily. Right, like, right, because you would never know to check out the Carter G. Woodson project exactly. on the Marshall website. Yeah, right. well, that, that's the thing. Google, where's it going to be? Yeah. yeah, ten pages in. Have you tried connections or um, Merlot or something? Oh, sure. Right. Well, I've got a statewide repository to put okay. it in that's yeah, got yeah. textbooks and objects and whatnot. But my point being, how do we? How could we? Get away from websites, but connect still. Yeah, and, and not overload the uh, connections with you know, or, or 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 perhaps create you know. Just one module and link it back. Yeah. Uh, yeah. 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 But, yeah. I was just thinking, um, in terms of what you have in Merlot and OER Commons, it's it's kind of the end resource, and you're sort of asking for inspiration in a way. And I'm thinking uh, a cookbook, just a list of ideas. Because there's always a thing about remixing, but part of that is obviously that it's not quite what you wanted. Mm -hmm. But then the more you go back to the basic ingredients, in theory, if I give you flour, you can make a cake. If I give you a cake, you can eat it. <laughs> um, you know, I'm not going to force you. You, know, you Americans like you're making your mind up. Impose cakes upon you, you throw them in the sea, and you get nasty. People will die. Um, Who could forget the Salt Lake Cake Revolt? Yes, yes. <laughs> Oh, there's a Wikipedia page waiting to happen. <laughs> if only we would have just drank that tea. Yes, exactly. It would have been so much simpler. Um, um, but the idea that we don't share recipes, we don't share yeah. ideas. I, I can list your ideas, but I think it'd be better to put them into a place where everyone can see them. Mm -hmm. And so the idea then that you can come to it with your own voice and your own ideas and then take it forward. So like the, like, I think some of the picture things are really good, but there are AR apps that do that as well, that do it really well. But it's that kind of... We, you enable you can't copyright an idea. It's like it's in the law. Um, so in theory, the, the sharing of oh, we tried this, we tried this, we tried this, and then an example of it is probably as good of an example of kind of an open of content as perhaps the end product is. Well, and 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 if your thought is to copyright it, then you're, you're not in the right business. I yeah. mean, you're just you're just not. Uh, I mean, I, I I I really believe in the idea of making education more affordable. And I, I put the word for students after that. And I, and I put a period at it. Because I want to make education more expensive for everyone else. Right? You can't have education without educators. Booker T. Washington, uh, great educator. He made lots of compromises. Right? We shouldn't be making those compromises because we are not in his shoes. But he turned a one-room schoolhouse in Tuskegee, Alabama into a university. And he did it with white money in Alabama in the early 1900s, all right? He was able to, to pull resources. And what he said, he said, what, he said, someone asked him, what would be the best thing? Uh, and he said, good teachers and plenty of money to pay them. I want to make education less expensive for students. I want to make it more expensive for everybody else, all right? I want to have small classrooms because I know that works. Last week, I took a group of students to an archive. I watched as they struggled with 19th century law books as we tracked down and found an 1838 Kentucky law that enfranchised women in school elections that people have written about but no one ever found before. And then we tracked it all the way to 1902 when it gets repealed. And we found the repeal was actually in a municipal law, not the school law. And then we found out why. They were trying to hide it and be subtle about it because black women were voting in larger numbers than, women, than, than, than white women. My students found that in one day. But I gotta tell you, they were frustrated, they were angry, but they stuck with it because I was their ride. <laughs> and, I said, and I took them out for dinner after so, That's an expensive project. Right? Education should be expensive, but not for the students. Right? And that's why I'm never gonna probably run for office, because <laughs> I don't think I'm gonna get rid of my folks. But. So I, I'd like to ask you a question about what I've seen as a barrier, specifically in history when we've been developing open um, content at our community colleges. And in, in history, uh, content had some of the kinds of things, you know, not specifically with you, but things like that. And other history faculty in our system looked at that and said, um, this is terrible. You know, this is low quality. This is not. So, uh, uh, which I disagree with. Okay. But um, have you had that experience?
experience in, or anybody else here and you know like you could answer my answer was hey that's not my job if you don't like yeah. it talk to your peers you know your history teachers you guys work it out that's um, but but the idea of, of these you know I, I mean I, I think these yeah. are great but there's a is there a resistance elsewhere is that uh, my special yeah I mean uh, you know, so so you know, stories are hard to deal with because we, we're passionate about what we do, and, and you know, so okay, uh, the Coursera, the, the very first five minutes of our, of our of our there was a Coursera lecture, and there was a screenshot, and there was multiple choice questions that it was asking when World War II started, and they were looking for 1939. Then the next slide showed where all the students were all around the world. Well, for all of those students in uh, in Asia. World War II did not start in 1939. What you are saying is, it matters when European people are getting invaded. But when Manchuria gets invaded, I mean, what an awful thing. How did that happen, right? And as historians and scholars, we need to not just be angry about this, we need to you know, say, hey, uh, I can help. <laughs> you know, um, so, you know, I don't know. What did they not like about it? Um, it, it wasn't, uh, well, personally, I think it, it, they were looking for more of a, for, uh, uh, a framework. You know, this is, it starts here. It goes, I remember what you're saying. Mm -hmm. it, it, World War II starts in 1939. We need to make sure that's in there, mm -hmm. as opposed to some activity that has an insight, but it doesn't have that, that content in yeah. it. That's, you know, the content is not there. It's, yeah. New content but that's not as good as people. D does that yeah, I mean, resonate with your? I don't know. And it sounds like you don't have that problem. They say it's either too much or too little. Right. So, uh, the, the criticism I've got, the reason people haven't used my book is it's too ambitious. Mm -hmm. Which, man, that keeps me up at night. Like, I, I get it. All right. The, the, the economic theories that I'm throwing out there, the, 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 your students aren't going to grasp because I'm still kind of, I still kind of have to, like, you know, I, I have to sort of back up myself. But I'm not waving a white flag. Right? I'm going to throw it out there. I'm going to try. They're going to get little bits and pieces of it. And I'm going to keep trying until I get it. I'm not going to skip talking about the tariff because students think it's boring or they don't get it. Because right? if you're talking about 19th century history and you're not talking about a tariff, no one in the 19th century would recognize what you're doing. <laughs> you know? and, and, and so that's the feedback I've got is that it was too ambitious. Um, but, you know, good. You know, I have uh, do something else if, if you think it's too ambitious. I'm not giving up yet. My favorite thing about what you're doing is it challenges students to uh, not just be consumers of knowledge, but be producers of, of it. And I think a lot of models, even in our open education discussions, keep students at the consumer level, and we're just changing out what the research sources yeah. are. Yeah, there's, there's an honesty factor of, you know, I, I, I have, you know, sometimes use PowerPoint. I'll have women's suffrage in West Virginia, I just have a bunch of question marks. At one point, I put a bounty on. <laughs> I said, I know that there is a, 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 I know that something happened. I haven't been to the archives yet. I will pay someone $500 to find an answer to this question. It was apparently not enough. I thought people would go for it. <laughs> but, you know, and I just, I, I, I think part of that lesson is there's so much we don't know. And they get to see how it's created. And they can see how, you know, the students in the Exodus of Project Wrong, they, Project. They were terrified that they were going to get it wrong. Yeah. I said, yeah, you, you, you're probably going to. That's why we revise history, because we get it wrong. We don't mean to. But you find new sources, and you, you, you find out what you wrote is based on limited information. You change it. But, but ultimately, they do better work when you make their work online. Um, I'm interested in your question about how you bring it together. Because like lots of teachers are doing this sort of stuff, and it's really powerful stuff. And by the way, I'm, I'm just so pleased I came to a session on history. I didn't realise I was. It's my passion too, although I'm not a history teacher. But I'm thinking of projects outside America that have had really powerful um, ways of bringing teachers from all over the country into into a project. So I'm thinking back to the Doomsday Project, which happened in England in the 1980s, and it, it came out as a video disc, and people don't even know what a video disc is anymore, yeah. when I was before the internet. But I believe that there's a bit of a movement going in in England to, sorry, the United Kingdom to get the Doomsday Project redone again, this time on the internet. So let me explain the Doomsday Project. Doomsday Book was a kind of a record of everything that was happening 
everybody who lived and everybody who paid taxes and everything in 1066 in Ireland. I might have that wrong because I'm not. I'm not. Okay. So right. the project run by the BBC. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. You can, you can help me because I'm an Australian. I'm not from England, all right? You get that right? I'm not from England. So I'm not from the United Kingdom. Um, so, but I, I uh, tried to get a project off the ground in Australia. It was called the Australian Doomsday Project because I love this. This project run by the BBC had students all around the countryside. Uh, I think it was mapped out in like one kilometre squares, one mile squares, uh, collecting information about that area and feeding it back to the BBC. Photos, there was a template, photos, data, everything about what was happening, not in 1066, but 1986, because I think it was meant to be the 100th you know, anniversary. Amazing. So all this data comes in and then gets collected. I don't think <coughs> I happen to be two video disks which map the whole of the country. So it's not just geography, it was history mm -hmm. as well and local area knowledge. So that, that is like everybody working together over right. a two year period to bring something together at a national level which then becomes a resource. So you're saying you're doing really good stuff, someone else is in another state doing really good stuff. What you need is a national project that can bring that all together. Someone needs to fund it to make it happen, but it's not very expensive because sure. the technology now is the internet. You didn't have to publish a video disc and the equipment that had to run it to send it all back yeah. out to schools. I mean, I mean, one, of, one of the ideas I had is I, I, I don't like the idea of a MOOC. Um, as much as, as big as my ego is, and I'd love to send, teach 10,000 students at once, uh, I, I can't justify it. But if we were going to do a MOOC, do an oral history project. Yes. All yeah. those 10,000 students, they interview five people. Yeah. And we, we, we record it, and That's it's right. digitally preserved, and 50 years from now, we now have a time capsule. Yeah. It's like the WPA project, That's except right. we did yeah. one semester. So you tie it to an event. So I was tying it in Australia to our bicentennial event to, to kind of record as a time capsule Australian yeah. I, I uh, think anniversary. Our, is our time officially up? Uh, it is. Okay. Uh, but yeah. My, my, yeah, my, my, my show is at 6 o'clock, so uh, uh, people want to talk or get a beer or if that's possible. Yeah. 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 Nice tea. Thanks for making history messy. Yeah. 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 Social media platform. Sorry, I'm asking a social media platform. Yes. Find the three or four. Choose Facebook, choose Instagram, choose YouTube, choose one of those. Have everyone bring it in. Someone who's been through the pile. Thanks. Thanks.